yeah, we are going to record this um, session because we, we're going to put these sessions on the um, on the portal for clients um, going forward as well. So, if colleagues haven't been able to access today, then they can access it um, at some point in the next week. Okay, so um, I think we'll start. Hopefully, everyone will be able to log on by the time we get into the nuts and bolts of it. But um, Good morning, everyone. This is um, a session, ER session, the ER room. It's Monday, the 16th of May, 11 o'clock, or just past 11 o'clock. Um, and this is the first of our ER room sessions um, and is a Q&A session. The, uh, and so welcome to everyone. We are starting to run these sessions now, and they are intended to be reasonably short um, sessions um, to, to give um, some information on current issues with regards to ER and how we should perhaps best best deal with the issues. And I think there have been a, I think we certainly have seen a rise across um, in, or in general terms of the ER, of ER issues uh, over the last few months. So today um, I'm joined by Helena, uh, who's an uh, ER advisor in our people projects team. And the format will be um, a discussion or a presentation, should I say, uh, across some of the issues of ER empowerment, uh, and then I will deal with some of the legal issues which arise. And I'll just share my screen so we've um, got access to the slides. Hopefully everyone can see that. So the agenda is gonna be what is empowerment? Why is it empowerment of managers key in ER matters? How do we best achieve that? And then issues of inconsistencies, and as I said, uh, of legal issues. So let me just check to ensure that everyone is now admitted who needs to be. Okay, there we go. So I'll, I'll hand over to Helena. Good morning, Brilliant. Helena. Marty and brilliant. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, so those who don't know me, I'm, uh, as Chris said, one of the ER advisors on the People Projects team. So we uh, support businesses with any on-site projects. Um, and the key one that relates to today is naturally the ER matters like uh, disciplinaries, grievances, capability issues, um, everything like that that we have um, deal with on site for, for HR teams where needed. Um, so yeah, today we're gonna to be discussing empowerment uh, and, and how that relates to the ER matters that we sort of deal with. So with anything HR related, there's so many different definitions of, of everything, but <laughs> empowerment is uh, no strange to that as well. But I think this one by Richard Kath Nelson really nicely summarises it as being the um, empowerment of employees coming to feel and behave as if they are in a position of power and as if they own their organisation. And I think another one as well um, that I saw by Hammer and Champy suggested that um, the empower of frontline workers is, is crucial for an organisation if they want to understand how best the business works because those frontline workers are the closest to the processes and you can think of that being managers but also any of the frontline staff that are dealing with the the day-to-day -day issues that that you're facing so essentially it's uh, summarized as creating a nice work environment in which employees have that ownership it's giving those employees the tools to make the decisions without super supervision and for senior managers to know that they're essentially making those right decisions in their absence. And that's especially crucial when we're thinking about the disciplinary grievance issues where those managers are making decisions that have the potential to, if not done correctly, uh, and in legal issues, which Chris will talk on uh, a little bit later. Um, next slide, please. Chris, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so in empowerment in employee relations, uh, a positive work environment is one that employees are empowered to do the job cor correctly and, and successfully. And so with that, there's three um, 
tools that are essential in making sure that employees are empowered, especially with management. And those are clarity, support and autonomy. With ER matters, we talk a lot about uh, support and challenging employees, and that's really where this comes to, to the, the forefront of it. So start off with the clarity. It's having those clear expectations and, and, and clear goals uh, of what's expected from the employees, because they, they can only succeed when they've got the, the clear goals of what they're expected to deliver, and they've got the, 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 the role of a manager who empowers them so that it moves from that close supervision to, to one of which they step back a bit and, and they're held accountable for their actions. And so for that, it means managers, you know, having the, the, those clear outcomes of what's expected, really. And that comes from the outset, really. Um, the second step is empowering them to, um, to, to provide the support and to give them those tools that they need in order to do the, the work properly and, and and that can be from anything in terms of just managers giving employees the time um, and when we talk about managers as well this can come from the the senior management team to, to some some of the the, the shift managers and and, and are sort on, on site and, and by giving them that time and support and investing in that because that's all what empowerment is we then will be in a position where you can give the employees the autonomy to do the work right and to be able to step back because the employees will then know what they're expected to do and be able to do so in a way that means that senior management will be comfortable with them making those decisions in their absence. So if there was something like a, a disciplinary or a grievance ongoing, that they'll have had that, that support and expectations set to know that they're doing it right. Um, research shows that when employees are empowered and research shows time and time again that they'll have stronger job performance, report higher job satisfaction and, and display a greater commitment to the organisation. And I think now more than ever, I'm, I know I'm always talking to, to clients and everything about the the great resignation and you see it everywhere in, in press at the moment having that um empowered employee workforce is going to really reward those uh, reap those rewards later down the line so it really does have that that dual positive impact really of from the organization getting better in performance innovation better quality of work all of those things that ultimately do affect the bottom line and then from the employee pers perspective it's uh given that empowerment the uh, work motivation and really creating that brand identity of creating that culture of, of an empowered workforce uh, next slide please chris <laughs> thanks um so when we talk about empowerment in er matters so ER or employee relations worth uh, refreshing what that actually is. So that's the overall management of, of employees to ensure that the productivity, engagement and professional development and well-being is all accounted for. And so the common ones that you, you think of often is being conduct, capability and, and grievances. They're the ones that hit day in, day out. Ultimately, how that impacts with empowerment is managers are the decision makers in many organisations. And so they need to be the ones that are equipped correctly to make the decisions on behalf of the business that is ultimately gonna benefit the business. There's no point um, having a, a manager conduct a process if, if they're not trained and or comfortable to, to do so. They need to be comfortable with those decision making, making um, with the decision that they're making to be able to have the, the correct impact. Sorry, next slide, please, Chris, thank you. Um, so just a, a bit of a refresh on, on the, the conduct capability, um, conduct versus capability that we often most commonly deal with as, as an ER advisor. At the face value, the two appear quite similar and it's often tempting for something that is a capability issue to, to go down the route of treating it as a conduct issue. So if an employee isn't expected to do something as part of the, the role, it can be difficult to know 
which route it is is it that they are unable to do the work and in which case it would be a capability issue or is it that they are choosing not to do it or are behaving in a, an unacceptable way and in which case it would be a, a misconduct issue the benefit of it empowering your workforce is hopefully that would avoid the need of going down a, a formal conduct or capability route because they'll have that buy-in and that connection with the workplace that might mean that their productivity will be at a higher level so you don't need to to instigate a capability process also just um talking back on where we, we mentioned earlier in, in terms of those clarity and ex, uh, setting those expectations if you've got those set right from the outset you might not have to go down something like putting in place a performance improvement plan um, um, or taking the formal action because those will have all been set from the outset uh, yeah, next slide please thanks chris thank you so with an empowered management it aims to move from um a micromanagement style of leadership to one of true leadership which involves coaching and, and mentoring so just in, in terms of touching on the differences between the the two of those so with coaching it's more of a task orientated uh, style of management which you, you generally might need to do for for potentially newer starters or for for a specific project that you might be working on it doesn't mean that um or, or i should say it's it's often for a, for a particular goal that you'd be coaching someone for versus mentoring is is potentially more of a uh, continuous development tool it's you developing that long-standing relationship um, investing in continuous development with them the manager isn't always have to be involved it can be from different managers within the organization that might choose to mentor and, and companies can often have uh, mentor schemes to do so uh, mentoring is more of a strategic development to, to get the most out of your, your managers and that is again feeding back into that empowerment of really giving them the skills in order to, to do that, that work as expected from them. Next slide please, thank you. Thank you. So how do we achieve empowerment? So I think there's lots of examples of how to achieve it. It's definitely a, not an exhaustive list as, as with anything is in HR, but some of the ones that really stand out to me, I would say, would be getting that management buy-in. You need to get the management team committed to an employee-empowered culture. Now, depending on what the culture is like in the organisation already, that might be easier said than done as to whether that's something that you would be able to do what sort of relationship you've got with the team is there a, a high level of turnover at the moment so that that level of trust it, it it has weakened for whatever reason but really spending the time and the commitment to get that management buy-in and the buy-in from senior members of the team will be really uh impactful in, in getting that empowered workforce i think that leads quite nicely into the the building of trust uh, element, which I also think is quite a, a crucial one of gaining that empowerment. That can be done from something like um, uh, career pathway schemes to giving tasks that you would normally give to management to, to, to some other members of staff in the workforce. It's showing from a senior management team that you've got trust in those employees to, to make the right decision or that where they don't, that um, there'll be a rationale behind that decision that was made and that they'll ask for support when, when needed, really. And uh, following on from that, by building trust, the part of that will come in from providing employees the right tools. And it can be something really as simple as fixing equipment, which sounds like um, and that's a, a very literal tool that you'd be providing the employees with to upgrading technology where needed especially i suppose we've all felt it in the past two years of uh, uh, that equipment um how quickly that's changed 
and then of course the most obvious being uh, providing a tra training to, to the staff members across the board when needed. Um, another one of those that I think is a, a really useful um, tool is the, the input from employees. Now it does lead quite a bit back into the, the management buying and the building of trust, but getting that impact, um, that input, sorry, from the employees is really going to make a massive difference. There, there was a survey done from Salesforce that says where employees feel their the voice is heard, the 4.6 times more likely to feel empowered to do the best work. Now, I mean, that speaks volumes in terms of things such as ER matters, where if you've got a disciplinary and the, the management uh, are empowered enough to know that they're making the right decision for the company, they feel confident and owning that decision, that's going to have, uh, you know, reap the rewards massively in the long run. All of these things, I suppose, it's definitely worth to note that it's no quick fix in terms of getting that empowerment. It's changing culture over years, which can be a really difficult and um, daunting task, depending on how long the situation has been as it is and, and what state of empowerment that you're in at the moment, certainly. Um, next. I think um, in terms of that, I think it's um, benefit if we discuss in terms of the legal issues that Chris will touch upon now in terms of what can happen when we, we don't have that empowered workforce and, and management team. Yeah, thanks, Helena. Um, so hopefully everyone can hear me. So I'm, I'm just going to touch, touch on, um, I guess, one of the, the biggest issues which arises from uh, what you would call lack of empowerment, I suppose, and, and or I, I suppose lack of sometimes lack of knowledge, maybe for ER issues. And I think some of the things that Helen touched on there, we we, te we tend to talk to, about them in terms of the three C's, which I, I know people use the references of capability, confidence, and consistency. And certainly, as as, uh, as lawyers, um, we like to see a degree of consistency in terms of how organisations have dealt with um, ER matters. And in fact employment tribunals do as well so if you've ever been to the employment tribunal and um, a, de a, a defense or a claim has been submitted the general argument which is is raised in certainly in issues of conduct or misconduct as well you've not treated me the same as you've maybe treated another employee further down the line and, and it's important from a statutory point of view because the the whole essence of certainly ER issues around capability and around conduct, mat related matters, flows around reasonableness. So this is kind of embodied within this, the Employment Rights Act, section 98.4. Obviously in terms of dismissals, one of the, um, the, the first things you need to prove is that you had a fair reason to dismiss, but secondly, whether we acted reasonably in all the circumstances. And that does take into account, as everyone, as everyone will know, uh, the size of the business and the um, and the administrative uh, resources that the employer has. So, with those certainly those two issues, even you know in, in isolation, um, the person who deals with the disciplinary deals with the ER issue needs to kind of, I guess, I guess, be cognizant of that of those facts, and that an employment tribunal will potentially be taking those into account in terms of uh, in terms of fairness. And of course, we now look at the band of reasonable responses. So again, a very kind of broad brush view in terms of has an employer acted reasonably? Um, have they acted within the band of reasonable responses? And do we understand what that actually means? Do we understand the, the um, obligation upon the manager who is um, conducting that initial disciplinary or indeed uh, and conducting that investigation as well. So I think it's, it's massively crucial when we look at um, ER related issues that, that um, individuals understand um, how these things work, how the mechanics of the law works, um, should things not be, should things not go to plan. Um, so we try and avoid inconsistencies and empowerment's great for avoiding consistencies and, and you know, having people uh, aware of their roles and responsibilities and should go some way towards that. 
Um, and of course, we have the ECAS Code of Practice as well, which you know employment tribunals need to take account of, and we obviously take account of. And most disciplinary procedures or capability procedures or policies are based on that ACAS code of practice. And that goes into, um, uh, it, it, or something that's reference to the fact that, um, any, that any decisions taken should be consistent. So just a few cases really, just to kind of reflect really back on some of these, um, the way the tribunals deal with consistencies. And in fact, employers have dealt with them as well and, and how we kind of, how that resonates, I suppose, with this kind of topic of empowerment, really. So if we look at the DOI case first, probably, because this this was one which um, I guess it was interested in terms of um, an, an employer perhaps not doing all they perhaps should have done in, in, in a particular case. But uh, the, the, the facts were that uh, a Mr. DOI worked for Clays. The Clays are, uh, anyone that knows them, they are commercial printer. Um, and he was initially employed on a casual basis in around in around about 2004. Um, and he was paid uh, yearly on working approximately 1600 hours throughout the year, but he could be required to work more hours and over some weeks rather than others. And he, and he had to pay uh, for shifts at different rates as well, which was which, which was on. But in in 2016, um, he had Mr. Doy had a dispute with his um, uh, his managers as to the wages and as to what whether in fact he was being paid correctly for for some of these shifts and the the dispute continued but ultimately clays decided to side side with the manager in the dispute not mr doy so what followed was then two incidents of threatening behavior from mr doy to the extent that um, his general manager um, actually had to move his family out of his out of his family home as he felt that there was some serious risk of danger to uh, his family from the claim Mr. Doy. So he was effectively dismissed for gross misconduct, Mr. Doy, uh, in respect of threatening behaviour, and he appealed it, and that was that appeal was rejected. And so he, as as you may expect, submitted a claim for unfair dismissal. And he alleged as part of that claim um, that there had been a disparity of treatment between himself on the one hand and other employees, including a number of employees who he claimed had made much, much worse comments than he had made. Um, and, and also a female employee who he cited who had actually struck um, another worker on two separate occasions. Um, so this went in front of the Employment Tribunal and the Employment Tribunal found that the reason for Mr. Doyle's dismissal was obviously for conduct. And they held that it was, in fact, within the band of reasonable responses. Um, and as such, they found that Clays had acted fairly in deciding that this was a sufficient reason for dismissal. Mr. Doyle, not being happy with this, applied for reconsideration by the Employment Tribunal. So you can apply for reconsideration just at the Employment Tribunal rather than an appeal. Um, if you think that something hasn't been considered or, or, or a claimant thinks something hasn't been considered, or in fact, an employer thinks that something hasn't been considered. Uh, and he again referred to the disparity in treatment compared with in incidents involving the female employee that he referred to striking other employees. Um, and he'd raised this in his claim form. Uh, and he also um, raised an incident that he later found about three other employees who had kept their jobs despite being found to have stolen a high profile book before its release date. So a book that was in, has been effectively being printed by, by um, Clay's. Um, and the EAT took this information, but effectively refused the application, saying that the points had already been raised at the original hearing. So this then went, did eventually go to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, and the Employment Appeal Tribunal held that um, the Employment Tribunal had not in fact considered all the facts at the original hearing, or the facts raised in Mr. Doyle's application. Um, and that the incident involving the female employee in terms of disparity had not been uh, and considered and that the employment tribunal had therefore erred when it had come to dealing with the original claim and it was then sent back to the employment tribunal. We, we don't know what happened after that, presumably the, the, the employer looked sort of settled the claim at that point. Um, but it, this is an interesting case because it, it, it does deal with this, this issue of disparity and consistency and it does serve, I guess, as a reminder for us, for as lawyers and, for, and as employers, uh, that we must strive to try and treat employees as equally as we can in disciplinary matters. Otherwise, and of course there are some exceptions which I'll come on to, but otherwise 
we do run this risk of us open, opening ourselves up at the very least uh, to claims of unfair dismissal based on this principle of, um, of disparity. Uh, and regardless, I guess, in some respects of the severity of the employee's conduct. Um, so we just need to be careful that we're dealing with disciplinaries and appeals. Um, and if there are inconsistent treatments or, or arguments of incons inconsistent treatment raised, then perhaps we go a little bit further to make some further inquiries about that. And that managers kind of almost take stock and say, well, actually, let's look at these other instances, even if the allegations which are being um, uh, put forward and the evidence which is being put forward on the face of it seems to be fairly overwhelmingly clear of, uh, of misconduct. Uh, and then the MBNA case, uh, which um, people will possibly be familiar with because it has been talked about some time in terms of VR matters. Um, but this is again around when should um, aspects of, cons of, of um, similar conduct be taken into account by managers um, and to what extent is something actually parallel in terms of facts. So just briefly, because I'm conscious of, of time on this, but the, the case, this involved a very, very odd case of uh, a work social event um, where two employees, Mr. Battersby and a Mr. Jones, were, um, there was an incident with them, which was, and it was initially dealt with in terms of what started off as being a bit of fun, a bit of banter with Mr. Jones. And Mr. Jones was doing, th was doing things like licking Mr. Battersby's face um, and then Mr. Battersby was started to knee Mr. Jones in the leg. So all very adult behavior. Um, and however, later in the evening, Mr. Battersby observed uh, Mr. Jones with his arms around his sister. Um, and so Mr. Battersby then again kneed Mr. Jones in the leg again. Uh, and Mr. Jones proceeded to then punch Mr. Battersby in the face. Uh, Mr. Jones left the event um, and then Further, uh, uh, and later on in the evening, Mr. Battersby then sent some uh, fairly abusive voice voice messages from his phone and threatening Mr. Uh, uh, and threatening uh, Mr. Battersby of um, uh, physical violence. So the employer investigated the incidents um, and dismissed Mr. Jones for gross misconduct. And Mr. Battersby, on the on the other hand, was only given a final written for his conduct. Um, and the employer found that a lesser sanction was appropriate as, as he was provoked to send the threatening messages having been punched in the face. Mr. Jones brought a claim of unfair dismissal and he argued that the sanction imposed upon him should have been consistent with the treatment of Mr. Battersby in view of the fact that there were similarities within the offences. And the tribunal upheld Mr. Jones's claim and said that the decision to dismiss Mr. With, to dismiss Mr. Jones was unreasonable on the basis that the defence of provocation had been applied differently to Mr. Jones and Mr. Battersby, and this was unreasonable. And the tribunal concluded that the respective decision to dismiss Mr. Jones and give Mrs. Battersby a final written warning was a result of the different provocation test applied to both. <coughs> and this amounted to an unreasonable disparity of treatment between the two of them during their respective disciplinary hearings. Therefore, the dismissal, the dismissal was held to be unfair. So there was then a further appeal. Uh, so uh, the uh, employer, in, interestingly, didn't take this line down um, and therefore um, appealed the decision. And that appeal went to the EAT and point appealed to the tribunal and that and, uh, the, 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 the appeal was successful um, against the decision. And in, in reaching its conclusion, the EAT emphasized that the relevant test was whether the sanction imposed upon Mr. Jones was within the band of reasonable responses. And it stated that if it was reasonable for the employee to dismiss the employee, the mere fact that the employee was unduly uh, lenient to another employee is neither here nor there. However, there are three sets of circumstances where inequitable treatment can raise a question mark over fairness. A, where the treatment of one employee leads another to, to believe that a certain act or course of conduct will not lead to dismissal, but then it does. B, where evidence of treatment in other cases suggests that the, the purported reason stated by the employer is not the real one, so that, based, that kind of goes to the, to the actual reason for dismissal. Or C, as here, where evidence of decisions in truly parallel circumstances may support an argument that it is not reasonable to dismiss in the circumstances. 
So what the EAT started to say, and I won't read out the whole judgment, but what the EAT, EAT went on to say is that it is highly unusual to get two sets of circumstances, two sets of facts that are absolutely parallel um, and stand on all fours with each other. So that there are always going to be situations in the main where an employer can argue um, or could could seem to argue, be deemed to argue that whilst that looks on the face of it like the same set of facts which happened previously, other issues have been raised which should be taken into account. So two, two different cases, two particular conflicting points, um, but the principle being that inconsistency um, needs to be looked at, needs to be taken into account, um, and we need to be clear when, when we are making these decisions um, that everyone understands the consequences of treating people differently in disciplinary and ensuring that people have the relevant skills uh, to deal with them. I'm conscious of time. Um, in Enterprise Liverpool and, and PLC, this is another this is another case of, uh, of inconsistency where it was effectively uh, unjustified. Um, but the justification was based on the fact that it was to do with an employee who was moonlighting, um, caught moonlighting using company vans during working hours. <coughs> and there was a distinction made between two individuals who had been with the company for a reasonably short period of time um, and were fairly um, new um, and who didn't apologize uh, as opposed to an employee who had been caught who had been the, with the organization for 30 years, an unblemished record, um, and did apologize. So again, with the knowledge that the, that the individual manager may have had in that case, they made a clear distinction um, that it wasn't just a case of the offense being committed, the offense being proven, and in fact, the offense being admitted. It was the fact that the offense had been admitted by one individual who had then apologized, which, which led to a different decision, a final written instead of dismissal, and the tribunal confirmed that was a, that was a more than reasonable way of, uh, of dealing with these things. So again, it's a very good example of an, of an organization taking a view on it uh, and coming to the right decision, having taken into account all the relevant facts. Okay, so... Um, and other aspects of inconsistencies, I guess, that, that, that and, or kind of ways to avoid it. I don't want to repeat what Helen has already said. Obviously, training is an obvious way. Um, having that ecosystem of support. <coughs> so having, um, having a, I guess, in some ways, a cultural um, uh, change within the organization that there are sufficient numbers of people who have knowledge and who have experience in um, ER matters, or at least know where to get the information from, having that support for individuals who need to have that discussion, who need to have that conversation, um, it, 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 to, to maybe stop a matter from escalating to formal disciplinary. I think transparency in technology is important, um, so transparency of previous decisions, it's, it's, it, it is always, um, it is always alarming when perhaps a previous disciplinary or previous um, conduct related issue has has kind of come out of the woodwork after someone's been dismissed and maybe someone hasn't been treated the same or maybe that they've been treated differently but it's not clear why they've been treated differently so you know some of the some of the cases were just looked at you know it was it was on some of them were clear why there'd been a difference so having that transparency whether that's in some form of system or spreadsheet or whatever it is technology is <coughs> um, is a big player and, and it's becoming more and more relevant i know from speaking to a few um clients recently a few organizations that more and more companies are now looking at software or technology and we have uh, the people portal which if you're a client you'll probably already have or have, have, have had access to it but we do have an employee employee relations module on that which gives kind of visibility in terms of reporting of the amount of disciplinaries, who's dealing with them, when, at what stage are they up to, uh, and they can, and, and can allow HR teams to dip in and out or managers to dip in and out of disciplinaries or ER matters. So that, that gives you a really good transparent view of where things are at with ER matters, which can help avoid these inconsistencies. Uh, and using data as well. So I think we're kind of more and more using data in, in obviously our day-to-day 
roles and kind of harnessing that data that can be drawn out of ER matters and using that to kind of empower HR teams and to managers to give a really good heads up in terms of what's going on in an organization and and also start to track trends as well you know why has such a such and such a department had so many types of disciplinaries or conduct issues why is that establishment that location not performing as well as another location so <clears throat> bringing in a strategic um, element to ER which a lot of us use in other areas of our business you know decision making within sales or performance from a commercial point of view you know why shouldn't that really be brought in from a, an ER point of view um, at a strategic level to aid decisions um, and, and, and you know, kind of really start to make a difference um, and I suppose kind of knowing when to intervene as well so kind of, I suppose from a from a an, 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 an HR team perspective or an, a, a people who are responsible uh, 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 in their roles for HR, it's knowing when to intervene with a manager, when to step in, at what point do you take a view, well, I'm going to have to make sure I get involved, or what process is adopted, I think, to avoid decisions being made which are not consistent and all have no basis for being inconsistent um, uh, you know, with other decisions, really. I think that's, that's quite an important um, element of it as well. Okay. Um, and I guess a final point from me before we kind of get some questions. Um, empowerment has to mean empowerment. And I think we, we've previously over the years what referred to this case of Ramful and Department of Transport. And I think anyone who's in HR in HR um, will likely come across this case. And it is a very important case in terms of if, if we're empowering managers to make decisions, which I think is the right thing to do um and to give them the skills and give them that confidence uh, and capability it's right that we don't start to then become involved in the actual decision um that the managers make and the Ramful case is is the case where the uh, and the manager had run a disciplinary um hearing and had uh, started in fact to draft the outcome and draft the decision and the manager then sought to take advice from uh, the HR team and during the employment tribunal the unfair dismissal case uh, evidence came out from the well in disclosure from the documents that the manager had actually um, drafted one version of the report and then that had significantly changed it become more um, kind of critical of the employee who was a subject to disciplinary and some of the, his credibility and his personality and attitude. And it, it transpired that that had come from the HR team. So the HR team had not simply just advised on process and best practice, but they had actually um, advised on the actual decision um, and effectively critiqued the individual. And that had led to a change in the report, which the employment tribunal said was wrong. And that shouldn't happen and that that leads on to that last point there that when we're dealing with um or when we look at empowerment and when we look at employee relations and we look at the potential what could happen you know the end game i guess we always look at an employment tribunal um you know as a, we always want to protect the business and we always want to ensure that we we do everything right not just because obviously that is the right thing to do but that when it is challenged we need to think well what will an employment tribunal ultimately want to see how will that actually work and the, the employment tribunal will always look at the mind of the individual making the decision as, as we all know so the employee employment tribunal judge will he doesn't want to hear from anyone else really other than the fact that other than the person who has made the decision. And if that person who's made the decision <coughs> doesn't really understand why they've made the decision, that's when the issues start to arise. So um, in, in, in a snapshot, um, you can see there the benefits of managers having that feeling that they have that empowerment, feeling that they have that confidence, that capability, not just to make a decision, but to articulate the reasons for that and to stand by that not just in a disciplinary hearing, but 
in front of an employment tribunal judge. So that concludes uh, the presentation. Um, we have a Q&A now. I don't know whether anyone's got any questions. If you have, feel free to um, put them in the chat box or unmute and ask them. And we have, I do have some questions um, which we had in advance, which I'm happy to ask Helena if she's happy to answer them. <coughs> uh, and some issues which kind of raise, I guess, raise on this topic really. So I'll, I'll, I'll crack on with these. Um, I mean, like one of the questions that we got on Thursday of last week was, and I think I've kind of touched on it to a degree, but um, when should HR intervene in disciplinary matters uh, if a manager is trained or empowered um, to deal with them? Yeah, I think that's a really uh, one that comes up quite a lot, I think, in terms of actualities of um, dealing with matters. Um, I suppose... What you've got to be cautious of is not stepping in too early um, uh, to, to, to one that you're necessarily changing the outcome to one that the manager wouldn't be um, comfortable in terms of dealing with. I suppose that more so if you that the the manager is the one that's making the decision and HR is writing all the letters, that's where you've got to be extremely... Yeah, so the case I was mentioning avoiding. there, the Ramfall case, yeah, it's yeah. probably on that point, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, if the... Where HR should intervene, I suppose, is where additional topics may come up, like you get it quite a lot where a grievance might uh, arise, something along those lines where it's um, escalating all those claims of unfair process or something yeah. like that especially if they've got merit um or if it is going to arise in inconsistencies in the outcome to, to what you've done for others and that's where maybe having like a precedent checker of, of what you've done yeah. for other uh, yeah. similar situations might be useful yeah i mean I, I i think it's a real i mean it's difficult but it's easy with technology but to kind of almost for the hr people responsible for hr to have that almost overview of what's going on at any given point as well. And I think somehow if you can get that moving in terms of process, the way it, whether that's kind of maybe one-to-ones or check-ins, I don't know, somehow, or as I say, technology, then that's, that's, that, that, that is always a good thing, I think. At least rather than actually stepping in, keeping that overview yeah. um, of, of what's going on. Uh, and then an, 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 another question, um, how do we deal with the scenario where the organization's leadership doesn't see the value in it? in ER matters being a management responsibility. I think that's saying, I, it's kind of, it should, it's just an HR, it's equal should be, HR. Yeah, yeah, should be HR. Um, I suppose with that, it depends who you're <clears throat> talking with in the management. I'm sure there's definitely going to be statistics somewhere that you could show up. If it's someone in senior management that like maybe a financial director or someone like that, that likes having statistics, showing them the, the benefits of it being a, uh, a management uh, issue rather than just HR's job and also upskilling upskilling is just it's going to have so many benefits in the future it's always about seeing it as the short the long-term gain rather than a, a short-term quick fix um shoving everything on on HR won't help when an organization will grow it's not a long-term strategy for for success yeah. I would say yeah I think evidence is key there as well, isn't it? Demonstrating the evidence, the, the value, the impact of of, um, of other people in the organisation having that, feeling that confidence in dealing with matters as well. Yeah. Apart from the issues I just mentioned before from a legal point of view. Yeah. Um, and then another one, which is not directly necessarily on empowerment, although it could, I suppose it could arguably be, be, a, be a consequence of lack of empowerment. That's is there a problem if a manager has started a disciplinary issue um, as a capability matter? Um, well, I, I suppose it as would always depend on the, the specific scenario and how far along in the process they were. I think there'd be more of an issue if you started a capability issue as a disciplinary uh, versus the other way, because a capability yeah. process is often more lenient than a disciplinary the, the issue is going to be more from the inconsistency point of view for other staff members I'd be um interested to know why they'd started it as capability if there was information that they weren't necessarily sharing at the at the, at the time um 
where like the employee maybe told the manager can you keep this uh between us maybe they've got like a friendship or something along those lines and that's why they started it is in a different route potentially but yeah I would say I would have more of an issue if it was a capability um started as a as a disciplinary depending on how far in the process yeah yeah I I, I guess the, the major point like you say is if it was done the other way around because the, the essence of capability is improvement and helping to improve then that would be more of a problem I suppose yeah um but yeah yeah, that sounds good. Um, then another one. Um, let's read this. We we have a practice of signing all our outcome letters from HR rather than the manager who has conducted the matter. Is that okay? That's an interesting one. I, I come across that quite regularly, actually, that a manager will do a disciplinary and then it will be signed and sent out by the um, HR team. Not sure I have a view necessarily on it, but yeah. Yeah, you do get it quite a lot. And I think... You tend to see it with um, uh, with organisations more at a point of where where they're growing maybe and maybe they're in that in between bit of managers haven't yet had the the been upskilled to a point where they do feel comfortable with the decisions and they're sort of asking the questions HR have prepped for them and um, and rather than probing into anything further um, yeah. I suppose ultimately the manager is going to be the one that has to stand up and make that decision. So really we'd, you'd want to get them in a point where they would feel comfortable signing their own letters. I'd be interested in knowing why they don't feel comfortable unless it is an organisation policy sort of view rather than the mm. management. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's it would be interesting to know whether the letter is, I, I've certainly seen them sometimes, whether letter is um drafted by hr the hr team but in, in on behalf of the manager so you know the it's the manager's it's the manager's decision but hr drafted it and it does become a little bit confusing that sometimes in terms of well is there an argument then to open up in terms of well you for the manager again against the, the organization well it wasn't the manager who actually made the decision it was the hr team or the hr manager and i suppose it's just kind of bringing something in which deals with that, I guess. But yeah, I suppose we need, probably need to know a little bit more on what, the, what, what is it just a sign off or is it actually being yeah. drafted? Yeah. Um, and then a fairly broad question, I think this is probably the last one, which is good in terms of timing, 10 to 12. Is there a strategic way of ensuring that things are done in the right way across the business? Um. I would say, I mean, every business is going to have a different HR strategy in terms of what they um, implement and what they would consider that the right way. I suppose the right way, however that looks for a business, is always going to have to be uh, following those key points of fairness in, with, with consistency. Um, I suppose implementing that training across the board, that would be... I think that's the first step that often gets skipped having that 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 training um other strategic ways is perhaps having surveys out to managers maybe um to, to, to get a yeah yeah a, a closed view of or anonymous view of what's actually going on in in the workplace um but in, in terms of the hr strategy um it's definitely something that should be implemented, but the, how that will look will be different for, for each organisation and, yeah. and the goals, I would say. Yeah, okay. Right, okay, I think that concludes the questions I've got. Has, has anyone got anything else they want to ask or any, any other questions for, for me or Helena? No. Okay, well, thanks very much for for everyone for attending today. Uh, as I say, we're trying to keep these reasonably short and with some uh, re an amount of information which is useful. Uh, and we'll be doing another one next month as well on a topic that we all pick and we hope to see everyone else there. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.